The World War brought out many startling tendencies of the human mind which corroborate the work which the psychologist has carried out in his research into the workings of the mind. The following account of a rough, uncouth, unschooled, undisciplined young mountaineer is an excellent case in point. Fought for his religion, now great war hero. Rotarians plan to present farm to Alvin York, unlettered Tennessee squirrel hunter, by George W. Dixon. How Alvin Colum York, an unlettered Tennessee squirrel hunter, became the foremost hero of the American expeditionary forces in France, forms a romantic chapter in the history of the World War. York is a native of Fentress County. He was born and reared among the hardy mountaineers of the Tennessee woods. There is not even a railroad in Fentress County. During his earlier years, he was reputed to be a desperate character. He was what was known as a gunman. He was a dead shot with a revolver, and his prowess with the rifle was known far and wide among the plain people of the Tennessee hills. One day a religious organization pitched its tent in the community in which York and his parents lived. It was a strange sect that came to the mountains looking for converts, but the methods of the evangels of the new cult were full of fire and emotionalism. They denounced the sinner, the vile character, and the man who took advantage of his neighbor. They pointed to the religion of the master as an example that all should follow. Alvin Gets Religion Alvin Cullum York startled his neighbors one night, by flinging himself down at the mourner's bench. Old men stirred in their seats and women craned their necks as York wrestled with his sins in the shadows of the Tennessee mountains. York became an ardent apostle of the new religion. He became an exhorter, a leader in the religious life of the community, and, although his marksmanship was as deadly as ever, no one feared him who walked in the path of righteousness. When the news of the war reached that remote section of Tennessee and the mountaineers were told that they were going to be conscripted, York grew sullen and disagreeable. He didn't believe in killing human beings, even in war. His Bible taught him, Thou shalt not kill. To his mind this was literal and final. He was branded as a conscientious objector. The draft officers anticipated trouble. They knew that his mind was made up and they would have to reach him in some manner other than by threats of punishment. War in a Holy Cause They went to York with a Bible and showed him that the war was in a holy cause, the cause of liberty and human freedom. They pointed out that men like himself were called upon by the higher powers to make the world free, to protect innocent women and children from violation, to make life worth living for the poor and oppressed, to overcome the beast pictured in the scriptures, and to make the world free for the development of Christian ideals and Christian manhood and womanhood. It was a fight between the hosts of righteousness and the hordes of Satan. The devil was trying to conquer the world through his chosen agents, the Kaiser and his generals. York's eyes blazed with a fierce light. His big hands closed like a vice. His strong jaws snapped. The Kaiser, he hissed between his teeth. The beast, the destroyer of women and children. I'll show him where he belongs if I ever get within gunshot of him. He caressed his rifle, kissed his mother goodbye, and told her he would see her again when the Kaiser had been put out of business. He went to the training camp and drilled with scrupulous care and strict obedience to orders. His skill at target practice attracted attention. His comrades were puzzled at his high scores. They had not reckoned that a backwoods squirrel hunter would make fine material for a sniper in the front-line trenches. York's part in the war is now history. General Pershing has designated him as the foremost individual hero of the war. He won every decoration, including the Congressional Medal, the Croix de Guerre, the Legion of Honor. He faced the Germans without fear of death. He was fighting to vindicate his religion for the sanctity of the home, the love of women and children, the preservation of the ideals of Christianity, and the liberties of the poor and oppressed. Fear was not in his code or his vocabulary. His cold daring electrified more than a million men and set the world to talking about this strange, unlettered hero from the hills of Tennessee. Here we have a case of a young mountaineer who, had he been approached from just a slightly different angle, undoubtedly would have resisted conscription, and likely as not, would have become so embittered toward his country that he would have become an outlaw, looking for an opportunity to strike back at the first chance. Those who approached him knew something of the principles through which the human mind works. 
They knew how to manage young York by first overcoming the resistance that he had worked up in his own mind. This is the very point at which thousands of men, through improper understanding of these principles, are arbitrarily classed as criminals and treated as dangerous, vicious people. Through suggestion, these people could have been handled as effectively as young York was handled and developed into useful, productive human beings. In your search for ways and means of understanding and manipulating your own mind so you can persuade it to create that which you desire in life, let us remind you that, Without a single exception, anything which irritates you and arouses you to anger, hatred, dislike, or cynicism is destructive and very bad for you. You can never get the maximum or even a fair average of constructive action out of your mind until you have learned to control it and keep it from being stimulated through anger or fear. These two negatives, anger and fear, are positively destructive to your mind. And as long as you allow them to remain, you can be sure of results which are unsatisfactory and away below what you are capable of producing.